Hey there folks, Bob Yeager here, and I took a break for the summer, uh, and I was working on Woodcraft League tutorials and writing up curriculum and getting a bunch of stuff together because we're going to be launching the new Woodcraft League membership portal pretty soon and making it available for all the members, and we have pledged 500,000 members before we even launch the thing um, so far um, at a minimum. So it's, it's going pretty well. And I had to take care of things like insurance and setting up the business entity and all those different things. But today I wanna to talk about something a little bit different. Now you guys know that I'm, I'm building this camp vehicle over here. We're actually almost done with all the mechanicals. We're just doing new body panels and that kind of stuff. And I didn't record videos on it because we kind of switched gears on it. Uh, that's gonna be my daughter's first car. She wanted it and uh she really loves it and so we're fixing it up and getting it ready for her uh behind me here though this is an interesting little find uh my neighbor right across the way here had this parked in his yard for i don't know how long you've probably seen it in the background in some of my videos actually and um he was having difficulty starting it keeping it running and things like that and one day he just slapped a for sale sign on it and i picked it up for twelve hundred dollars um it's a 1968 chevy c30 um with a dump bed and with the inline straight six 292 that ups trucks actually have in it um now what's funny is is it took me all 15 minutes of owning this vehicle before i had it running at top condition like perfect but the reason i want to talk about this today is because i'm starting some um outdoors projects where i needed something a little bit bigger i needed something to do some you know, uh, moving some logs and things like that. And I have tractors and things like that, but it's really handy having something like this. Um, not to mention the parts are widely available. It takes most of the same parts as the C10 does. Um, and I'm not doing restoration on this. This is a forest truck. This is, that's what it's gonna be meant for, uh, doing work at camps and things like that, okay? But the reason this is important because um, you or maybe you have kids that are starting to drive and they wanna get into doing some landscaping or some outdoors projects and things like that. And conveyance is really important. Now I get the four wheel drive here um, and obviously that's gonna be a great camp vehicle for my daughter, do a little bit of light off-roading and things like that. They're fantastic for that kind of thing. But when we wanna get some work on some property or homestead or something like that done, we need some hauling capacity. We need something with a little more capability than four-wheel drive. This is not a four-wheel drive. I don't need a four-wheel drive when it comes to this thing. But I wanna to talk to, to you about some things that I look for. I bought in, I couldn't even tell you how many classic cars and trucks over the years and rebuilt them and flipped them and sold them and those types of things. And if you search YouTube, on you know getting classic cars running you see these guys they're out in a field it hasn't can we get it started after 30 years of sitting and everything um they do a really great job at showing you how to get something running the problem is you have to realize that a lot of those guys are in business to flip those vehicles so they find these old vehicles out in the middle of nowhere in a lot of rust free states and things like that they get them running just to show people that it will run and then they flip it and the next guy that buys it off them is going to rip the engine and transmission out of it and put something like an ls swap or something like that in there for all those of us that want to get it to use it to drive it to to keep it going and want to use what's in it we have to look for a few things so when i first picked this up which i've been enjoying driving it uh, for the past couple months when i first picked this up um it has a it had a hesitation while it was running and it was also running really rich. So step one, learn how to read spark plugs. Um, if you go to buy a vehicle and you ask the current owner if you could pull spark plugs, take a look to see how it's running, especially if they mention there's some problems with it, and they say no, walk away. It's that simple. When I talked to my neighbor, he was more than willing to let me, he let me borrow it for a couple of days, just drive it around and um, see what I liked and what I didn't like about it and if I saw any problems with it. He knows that I work on these things um, and have for many years. And when I was a kid, my family didn't have um, new cars. We drove all from 70s and back. We didn't, we didn't drive any new cars. So there was a hesitation in here, and it was running rich. Um, the richness was mainly carbon buildup, so it wasn't anything drastic. Now, this has a single-barrel carburetor on it. What I did was I took the air cleaner off at first to check that, and it was fine. Um, and then I took some Berryman's um, B12, and while it was running, I dumped it down the carburetor very slowly, and I kept doing that until I got through a full can. Then I dumped the can in the gas tank, 
and filled up the, the tank. Drove it for a few days, dumped another can down the carb, put another can in the gas tank, filled it back up, drove it for a few days, and it, it cleared up. Actually, after that first can down the carburetor, it cleared up. So now it's just about maintaining, okay? The second thing was um, they put a ceramic fuel filter in line in the carb. So originally there's a fuel filter inside the carb, um, right? So your fuel line comes in here, it's inside. Um, I've seen people have external fuel filters and never take that fuel filter out because they didn't know it was in there and it just gums up. But they had a ceramic one in there and those ones weren't really meant for internal carb on a single barrel. They didn't have those back then. Um, for now, what I did was I pulled that ceramic one out and I put the regular paper filter, accordion filter back in and it's running fine. Um, what I'm doing later on is I'll be putting a filter before the fuel pump and one after the fuel pump. I like to have two. The one before the fuel pump is typically um, a canister fuel filter. So I'll be putting threaded lines on, things like that, to have a canister fuel filter. The one after the fuel pump, I typically have a clear one, not a glass one. They leak. One of the just clear plastic ones, a big one. And that way I can see if anything's coming through that fuel filter before it gets to my car. Okay. Uh, rebuild kits for those are fairly inexpensive. Uh, so it's pretty easy to rebuild one of those. And if you don't know how, uh, you can look that up online. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, the next thing was I wanted to check for um, leaky head gaskets. Uh, that, that's a big thing a lot of people don't realize. Um, you can get a uh, radiator pressure tester, okay? And so when you unscrew your, your radiator cap, that thing has a cap that screws on there and you pump it up. And what I do is I pump it up until it gets pressure and make sure it's full. Pump it up until it gets pressure and I leave it sit for 30 minutes while it has pressure on it. If I come back and there's still pressure on that gauge and it hasn't dropped, I don't have a leaky head gasket, I'm good. If it's dropped significantly or I see water seeping or air, I can hear air coming out somewhere, then I know um, I probably have a leaky head gasket. Um, the hesitation while it was running, I first things first, a lot of the videos on YouTube you'll see uh, guys say, well, I don't want to pull the distributor cap and rotor button and points and plug wires and spark plugs and coil and all this stuff and just put all brand new stuff. I want to show you I can get it started. Well, that's all well and good. I did the same thing. I went through the motions of getting it started. And actually, the reason it was having a hard start and hesitating was right here, the coil. But the coil wasn't bad. This yellow wire here was just laying there. It was loose, the nut was loose, and it was just laying there. So it wasn't getting a, a good connection, okay? So I just plugged it in, turned it on, it fired right up, first start. Really easy, actually. So that was a simple fix. But then I went through and I checked the points, and the points were dirty. Uh, so I changed those. You can clean them, but I changed them. They're not expensive. I put new plug wires, distributor cap, rotor button, points, spark plugs, um, I don't really need to change the coil, but I probably will. It does have rust on it. It's a metal coil. It has rust on it, um, and it's probably seen some better days. This truck originally has 95,000 miles on it. It's the original engine and transmission on it, okay? The other thing was um, if you went over 40 miles an hour in this truck, not only would it want to pull you off the road, but it would rumble and shake. It was rumbling in the front end, and it was rumbling and shaking in the middle part underneath the cab of the truck and then it would pull you to the left. And so I knew it was a steering issue. Well, the first thing you check, um, let me pull my phone off of here to make it easier on us. First thing you check are the tires. Now I knew he had just put about $600 worth of tires on the back of this vehicle. So those are in really great shape. So I went over and I checked the driver's side tire. And although it's got a bit of cracking and everything, the tread's fairly even all the way across. So I'm like, well, that's not too bad. So I got to the passenger side tire. Now this might be hard to see. I'll try to get in here. It looks even from where you're looking at, but if I run my finger across here, this middle section of tread is way higher than the outer section. We were like, oh, well, and it just needs new front tires. That's what was making the steering bed. Now, um, next thing I did was I jacked it up. And once I jacked it up, I grabbed a hold of the steer and one of the wheels and I shook it. And this, let me see if I can get that in the shot. This was shaking all over the place right up in here. Okay. 
that is the pitman arm that's connected to our steering box our drag link and that's what makes us be able to steer the truck okay that was flying all over the place so obviously that was creating the steering issue of pulling me off the road um, along with that tire which i got two new ones to put on today well here's the thing you have to ask yourself okay was that because the pitman arm was old yes okay the pitman arm was old there was no grease fitting on it um and it was it was broken it, it was gone you need a pitman arm puller to pull that off it's not hard to do you need the right size sockets to so check the size of the socket because you probably don't have that one in your toolbox um, and you want to be very careful pulling that off they can be a pain okay uh, because they've been on as i was saying they could be a pain because they've been on there for a long time but the thing was the pitman arm problem was caused by another problem and i'm going to try to get down in here so you can see but right here whoops right there is a steering box and on top of that where right where my finger's at is the adjustment so if there's too much slop in the steering a lot of times it's going to be your steering box that's the problem well that steering box um is adjusted almost all the way out so i adjusted a quarter of a turn and i don't have much more adjustment so that steering box needs replaced on it okay the other rumbling that was going on underneath it is called a carrier bearing or a keeper bearing. Um, basically, you have multiple pieces to a drive shaft. So I have a front drive shaft that slides through the bearing that's on a cross member in between the frame. And then I get a rear drive shaft that has a yoke that slides back and forth. And that makes it so your, your drive shaft doesn't bind up on you. Um, so I had to unhook it from the differential in the rear end. That's your rear axle. Um, slide that off. And then I had to unhook it from the transmission. And then I just took that, that piece of the drive shaft up to a local garage and for 20 bucks, they removed the old bearing and dust caps for me. And I gave them the part, I had it with me, uh, which cost about $40. And they pressed the new one on with the new dust caps. Brought it home, put it back on there. The thing is you wanna mark um, you, your yokes and where your drive shaft's sitting in line with your differential and with your transmission and where the two pieces come together on the yoke shaft because those drive shafts are balanced. So I had to mark everything and then I just waited a couple days until they had time to do it. They called me up, went up, got it, threw it back on there. This truck wasn't inspected when I got it. Um, after I fixed the, uh, I replaced an emergency brake. Um, it was actually just the cable was broken. Uh, so I put a new cable on it and it was fine. Uh, replace the emergency brake, put the new carrier bearing on there went right through inspection. This thing's running great. I, I'm, I do have to adjust my clutch. I get about an inch of play that I don't like in it. This is supposed to have three quarters to an inch of play. Um, it's got two inches of play, uh, but it has a lot of adjustment left, which means I probably have a lot of clutch left. And that's the way I think. Then I took the inspection cover off the bottom of the bell housing of the transmission to look at the clutch pads, and there's a lot on there. So the clutch is fairly new on there, okay? Um, I checked. And here's something that you want to keep in mind when you're looking at these kind of vehicles, especially old ones. Um, the tag is usually right about here for the um, car specs. It wasn't there. I'm sorry, it's on the passenger side on this one because um, they replaced it, the fender. But they gave me the tag. They pulled off the old inner fender. Um, there's also a tag in the glove compartment and one inside the door jam of the driver's side door. So when I'm looking at these things, I think to myself, okay, first things first, um, can I fix it? Um, second thing is, is how much are parts for things like this? They're fairly inexpensive for this truck, actually. Um, third thing is, is there any obvious glaring things? Like um, the windows are all in place, but see, there's movement, right? That's because the seals are gone in here. The seal kit it covers both doors the vent windows and everything it's 280 dollars so you have to take those things into account uh, i knew that keeper bearing was bad uh, i knew they were about 45 bucks i knew the pitman arm was bad i knew those are about 30 dollars um the coil things i built a lot of chevy trucks i have a lot of parts in a box that are brand new i always kept certain parts around that fit this truck um but i didn't have to use any of them Okay, I had to go buy parts. Um, so sills on the windows is a good idea. These mirrors are not original. I don't like them. They're not three-point attachment or anything, so they don't, they don't stay in place very well. And then there's bodywork, lower fenders, lower door skins, body panels are about 
Um, for defenders, about $20 a piece. For the lower door skins, are about $30 a piece. That's the only body work I really have to do besides some dents. But like I said, this isn't a restoration. So you have to keep in mind, if this is for woodcraft purposes, uh, camps and you know maintenance and things, this is a maintenance vehicle, it's what it's for, uh, how far do you need to go with it, right? Are you needing to make it pretty, you know? Um, I'm not hiring this truck out, right? So the only other issue I had was with the, the dump bed. It worked perfectly. Dumps up and down perfectly, flawless. But the PTO that's connected to the side of my transmission that makes it dump up and down was constantly spinning because you couldn't shut the PTO off. So driving around, as soon as you disengage the clutch, driving around, that PTO was constantly spinning. Not only is it dangerous because if somebody was bumped the leather, lever in the truck, I'd be driving down the road with my dump bed going. Um, it's not supposed to spin at that many RPMs. So it can cause a lot of premature wear and tear on the seals and the gearbox and everything like that. Um, it was a simple thing. Uh, the interior of this truck is really nice. Actually, it's high. It's really gorgeous. Uh, really nice thing. Um, see this? It's a PTO cable. Um, since it's mounted on this side, it has to go over across the firewall, around the transmission back. There's a big curve in it, a big kink in it. Uh, so I'm moving it over to where the dump lever is. Uh, so it's a straight shot back, just four feet. And it, it'll plug right into the box that way. So what I did was um, I had my wife get in while I had the emergency brake and everything on and chalked the wheels. She got in, she engaged the clutch. I got underneath, manually shut off that gearbox, and then I had her disengage the clutch. So it's not running. Now I have to get under there and you know, until I get the cable on, get under there and re-engage it when I want to use the dump and everything, but I don't care. Um, the other thing is older vehicles, especially old trucks, the gas tank is behind the seat. And that's something you want to check out, you know, along with your fuel lines and everything else. Um, luckily, my neighbor had just replaced the gas tank. He put new rocker panels, these panels here. You want to check these out. He put new cab corners in new floors, new carpeting. Um, he took care of what's typically problem spots for these things. The other thing is doors were hard to close. He thought the hinge pins in here were broken. Uh, that is something to look for. Those bushings do go bad. So he gave me a new set of hinge pins, but that wasn't the problem. I didn't even bother changing them. Uh, this latch plate was adjusted too far out. So it was jamming up the door every time I went to close it. Uh, actually needs just a little more adjustment, but it's fine. Uh, before we, we had to slam that pretty hard. But because of that, and that's why I knew there was a problem with closing the door before I even opened this door for the first time. See this handle? There's no button. You have to put your finger in here and open it up. Now, the reason he didn't replace that is because a set of those handles are $55 on rockauto.com, which is where you can find a lot of classic truck parts and car parts. Close this up. It's raining. Why in God's name am I telling you all this? Well, I think that in the outdoors industry, we get caught up a lot in things like knives and axes and tents and sleeping bags and what gear, this gear and that gear that you use and things like that. Hang on just a second. So we get caught up a lot in the gear right? The clothes, the, the bags, the knives, the axes, uh, the sleeping bags, whatever, tents, right? But we never, in the outdoor industry, we don't talk too much about this kind of thing, right? For me, I have a homestead. Um, I chop a lot of firewood. I grow things. I have animals. Um, I have a barn. Um, I have trees that come down all the time on the property. Um, I have a camp in the back. And I'm acquiring, buying new camps. I, I need a general maintenance vehicle, okay? So when I look at something like that, for one, I love classic trucks. <laughs> so uh, it suits me well. And I've always drove old beaters around. Uh, my family gets a kick out of it, actually. But when I see something like that, and it's something that's going to potentially go to the scrapyard because somebody doesn't, they say, oh, there's too many problems with it. No, they just didn't know how to diagnose the issues, okay? But when we get into this sort of endeavor of camping and the outdoors, and if you're an instructor or something like that, or you 
you uh, deal with a group of people all the time in this situation, you want to make sure you have a vehicle that can do the job. You know, this off-road vehicle uh, over on the other side, the Chevy Blazer of my daughter's, um, there's another one similar to it coming. And we're gonna be using that for the Woodcraft League stuff. Um, this tr orange truck is for the Woodcraft League stuff, right? I don't use my personal vehicles for my businesses. But when you're just looking to venture into the outdoors or you have a teenager or you are a teenager and you're looking to get your first rig for camping and fishing and all the outdoorsy stuff we like to do, hunting and all those things, you gotta um, take the time to to think to yourself, well, just because it's a, a budget price that they're selling it for doesn't mean that it's worthless. Uh, take the time, climb underneath it, look it all over, check for any holes or anything. Um, take, grab a hold of your drive shaft, see if it shakes around. It could be a keeper bearing, it could be um, your universal joints. There could be a band from the universal joint missing or the bolts just might be loose. Uh, check that steering. Um, you know, really give it the once over. And if you don't know how to do all those things, um, take it to a garage. But while the garage is looking it over, have them allow you to come underneath it while they have it on the lift to look it over with them. So they can teach you some of these things. Uh, the brakes on this is all drums and everybody keeps asking me if I'm gonna switch it over to power steering, or I'm sorry, um, disc brakes. Well, for one, it's manual brake setup right now, so then I'd have to do a power brake conversion. Um, but two, and this is where it's personal for you. Where I live, okay, these vehicles do not get stored inside. They're in a gravel driveway all the time. It's very wet here all the time. Our driveway is always wet. When you have disc brakes and rotors, and vehicles tend to sit for a little while because I don't drive the truck every day, they rust out completely, <laughs> okay? Um, so the drums are sealed and uh, they're more protected and they'll last me longer for the things that I do. The drums are sealed, um, they'll last longer, they won't get all rusted up on the inside and uh, they suit me for the things that I do. And I've been driving manual brake and manual steering vehicles for a long time. Now this is power steering, um, but Notice I went through all these checks. You know, I, I looked at certain things and I played with certain things and I did tune-ups. I didn't expect a perfect vehicle when I bought it. I knew there would have to be some things that I would have to do. And so I said to myself, would I be willing to put $2,000 into this vehicle? Well, yeah, it only cost me $1,200. Um, the value of this truck, under 100,000 miles, original engine transmission, um, perfect compression. Um, it wasn't beat all to hell and back. It's in really good shape works really well. Um, this truck could easily sell for $7,500. Keep in mind, that's if I fix the holes in the fenders, you know, those kind of things, right? Um, if I restored it, and I mean restored it, it'd be a $25,000 vehicle. Um, I'm not looking to do that. I bought it for per my own use, right? So you have to take a lot of these things into account. Um, it's great when we look at, you know, $300 axes and all these things. Uh, but I could tell you more times than not, um, I'm, I'm using a hardware store axe that I bought for like 20 bucks. More times than not. Um, around my every day, what I use, that's the kind of stuff that I use. I don't beat up my Grand Force Brooks and all that stuff. And, and I didn't buy those things. Those were given to me as gifts, okay? Um, when it comes to other things, I say to myself, like, what, what's my return on this investment? Um, if it's just for teaching classes and stuff, I don't need really high-end gear or anything. I use really nice gear that lasts me for a long time because I use it all the time. But uh, for a hobby, if you're doing it as a hobby or if you're in scouts or something like that, get the gear that's going to do the job that you need to do when you need it and that you can tune up or tweak and fine-tune, but don't blow your budget on that kind of thing. Also, if you're a teenager, I mean, when I was a teenager, we ran, my family ran a bunch of cemeteries and we had lawn mowing equipment, push mowers, you know, riding mowers, walk behinds, tractors, weed whackers, all those things. I had a pickup truck. I didn't have a dump truck, but what I did was um, I spent an entire summer just mowing neighbors' lawns, cleaning gutters, cleaning their windows, pruning shrubs, leaf cleanup, weeding, that kind of stuff, uh, putting mulch in their beds and stuff. I had a little 1984 S10 Chevy pickup. Um, and at the end of the summer, I bought my first dump truck and I bought a trailer um, before the beginning of the next summer because I plowed snow with that dump truck, right? 
and then I got the trailer and I was able to start buying my own equipment and I built a big landscaping company that I sold in the early 2000s for a couple million dollars. Okay, so during especially times like this when people are wondering how they're going to get through or how can I do this or how can I do that and they're relying on stimulus checks and those kind of things, I say to myself, why don't you buy something that's going to return on itself? Um, if you're out of work and you don't know what to do and you have a lawnmower, a weed whacker, and a leaf blower and a pickup truck, uh, go mow lawns. You'd be surprised how much money you can make. Um, is it the greatest work in the world? No, but it's, it's relaxing and it's calming. Um, not to mention, as you progress in your wilderness skills and things like that, you'll find that you want to experiment with different things. And that might be things like kayaking and canoeing and um, longer range camps or, or longer term camps and taking canvas tents with you and things like that. Uh, a truck helps. Um, for me, like I said, this is primarily for grounds maintenance. Um, and I know how to look them over and I know how to fix them. Um, if you don't know how to work on them, then that's another thing you have to consider. How much is it gonna to cost to have somebody else fix it? How long will it take for you to learn how to fix it? Will, will it just become another project sitting in your driveway, All right? I know it's a weird topic as my first video coming back after my break, um, but it's something that's top of my, my mind. And I noticed when Dave Canterbury was doing his Jeep videos because he was really thrilled. He's getting into overlanding and things like that and people are like oh we want the woodcraft videos and the bushcraft videos and stuff it's like yeah but this is part of it too conveyance is part of it we can't ignore that part like right now he's been doing a lot of um uh ham radio stuff because he, he went like i did and took his ham radio license test um communication is part of it he has instructors out in the wilderness that are sometimes pretty really far away from the school in the uh, state game lands or state forest there and at his school and he needs to be able to get into touch with these guys and communicate and needs emergency communication. So you have to understand that all these other things are part of what we do and they're part of the things that we teach as well. It can't just be about carving sticks and bushes and making huts and you know building fires and cooking steak. Um, it's more than that, okay? Um, coming up real soon, I'm gonna be releasing um, a pretty cool video series I'm putting together. It's a mini series on the Master Woodsman. Um, which is actually the initial first training that's going to be in the Woodcraft League. It's a concept um, that I, with permission, I borrowed from David Westcott, who wrote Camping in the Old Style. Um, and the first um, kind of quite a few videos of training in the Woodcraft League of America, the foundational elements of the program is going to be based upon the Woodsman, Master Woodsman series. So that'll be coming up soon. Um, my kids just got back to school. I'm just getting back to... Um, doing some of the other stuff. I did some summer camps over the summer and things like that. I took a personal summer and um, I want to bring you guys some new and exciting videos, but I want to start off with something like this. All right, take care.